the trouble with ADHD, whenever we're trying to look at what is e effective work or even effic um, e efficacious research interventions for ADHD, the problem is that ADHD is a little bit of a moving target. We know it's a categorical disorder that you're diagnosed with it or you're not diagnosed with it, but it's a fallacy. As I've explained to you, it's a dimension, a continuum. So all of these symptoms are distributed normally in the population. Just that if you have a certain number, it increases the risk. So the medical field says, you have ADHD. If you have one symptom less, you still have just as much impairment, but you might not get the diagnosis. What it means in a classroom is that even students with mild or moderate symptoms of ADHD, as I explained to you, of inattention, may typically exhibit the same cognitive and academic weaknesses. This is why we don't want any treatment specific for a disorder. We also know ADHD is associated with poor academic outcomes, so we have to target the academics, not just the behavior, and that we know that it's in attention rather than the impulsivity. We, the major challenge is that, as you know, ADHD is diagnosed within the medical system. Rarely, if ever, teachers are involved right from the get-go in diagnosis. At, our, at the Hospital for Sick Children, we do as much as we can to contact and talk with teachers early on by interviews, rating scales, and so on. But there's minimum dialogue, to be honest. The other major challenge then, you've got it on one hand, it's diagnosed in the medical system outside the educational system, but the other hand, it's not formally recognized within the education system in Ontario as a special needs category, only if the youngster meets another uh, special needs category. Accordingly, this is not going to be incorporated into initial teacher training because there is no reason from the education perspective. And of course, there's very little communication in general between the medical system and the educational system. So all of these things really make it difficult to know what to do with the youngster in my class. What we know, though, is that when there have been work that's worked closely between education and medical and, and research, the studies do show that what happens is the biggest change is in reduction of teacher stress, teacher burnout, and therefore, an, an increase of capacity to use more of the effective instructional strategies for these students. And that teacher, when these teachers use these practices, then we'll see huge gains in the academic and behavioral outcomes for these youngsters. So we've been working with this set of materials called Teach ADHD, which we put up on a website. We developed a series of materials. This is funded by many of our national agencies, United States, Canadian agencies, TV Ontario and, and, and Shire, for example. We work with a group of people. And we did our best in the sense of we tried at this time, several years ago now, to develop a series of DVDs talking about ADHD, the symptoms of ADHD to try and help recognize them, and little snippets about teaching. The videotape was just meant to be a, an enticer to learn more. We also then were asked just to develop a, a, a little brochure to go with the DVDs. It turned out that our brochure ended up as a manual, um, and then we thought, well, that's it, we're done. We've given you all the materials. Here, teachers, here's the materials, to realize, of course, that was totally inadequate. Um, so what we then did is to first hold a, a three-day workshop with a group of educators from around Ontario, um, and then they reviewed the materials and said, well, it's, you're sort of on the right track, but really and truthfully, you're way off. We can't use these materials directly to know what to do in our classrooms. So we revised them considerably, um, and then said about how do we use these materials, the support, the resources, in a way that might help you use them in everyday life in classrooms. So there's been several um, movements since uh, 2006 or 7 when we published all this work. And one, I call, it, I call it train the trainer. You may have different terms for it. This is with, the, first of all, the Ontario Provincial Demonstration Schools that many of you know are three schools, Trillium, Amethyst, and Saganaska, for youngsters with severe LD and ADHD. And they decided they wanted to... So these are they secund teachers from around the province and train them in terms of being master teachers in working with these youngsters. And then they go back to the school boards after about two years. 
So they asked, approached us and said, would we work with them as a knowledge exchange, which we did. So we started, we shared them the materials, they incorporated them for the secondary sector. And then we now have been co-teaching summer institutes for teachers from around the province. So now it becomes much more linked with curriculum, for example, than the original set of materials. Um, another one is customization. So some school boards um, have said, well, this is fine, this is a good starting point, but we need to do it our way for our school board and our teachers. So uh, one example is from the Brent Haldeman Norfolk board, who said, well, can we just take some of the materials and customize it for our own purpose? And that's what they did. And they taught the content to teachers in their whole of their boards. So the special education resource teachers first trained themselves as a professional learning community, and then they each went to their own areas and schools and taught the other classroom teachers using their interpretation of the, of the work and a series of seven. So they have sort of, they've constructed their own templates and so on, um, developed what they call a, a, a placemat. So many of the strategies we have in the manual over several chapters, they decided to put together as, quote, a prompt sheet, if you like, for teachers to have at hand easily, and it's laminated. So they presented it in a very nice format. Um, they then ran these seven sessions after school for, like I think it's 4.30 to 6 o'clock, for interested teachers and gradually went through the materials as a group. So they had constant feedback and questions using some of the materials that we had set up for self-learning. But then they read more and more together and they said together the dialogue amongst the teachers was perhaps the most effective in terms of really trying out different strategies that we'd suggested, debating them, modifying them themselves, and then using them. And so they also then um, developed from those materials a delightful um, uh, set of slides called What ADHD Students Wish Their Teachers Would Know. And they said, in fact, they found this to be the most effective tool for the teachers. Um, they, they had initially designed it truly for the parents. Um, and likewise, we've been doing some international teaching, particularly the consultation model in Singapore has been the most exciting in some ways because they decided to do joint GP training and educator training. So they wanted to set up a GP educator network to get a much more close collaboration between the medical system and the education system. So over the course of three years, we've now been teaching different sectors, the we're educational psychologists and the school support teams. And this year now, their Singapore team is coming to Toronto to learn more. So these are the types of... But you can see, that if you get the message, it's not quick. This type of work is not a prescriptive what to do, but rather principles and ideas using your own knowledge and strategies as teachers, but always understanding them within the context of these youngsters who have these cognitive difficulties with working memory and sustained attention. However, we finally said, okay, we've been doing this a lot, but is it going to be effective? If we provided a series of professional development workshops over the course of a year, would this actually help teachers really work with the students? And if so, would it help the students' outcome? So we've been doing a randomized control trial um, with the Blue Water District School Board in Owen Sound, where half the schools... Um, had the workshop immediately, and the other half had it later. We did it, ran it as two separate cohorts, um, using about you know various uh, teachers, and always obviously with consent from teachers and from students. And the key questions we asked were: Could we enhance the teachers' understanding of these neuroscientific advances in ADHD over the course of a, a one year? And if we can. Could we then see an, an, an increase in the teacher's use of the more effective instructional strategies that would take into account these, the, what I call the neuroscientific understanding of ADHD? And if so, would it lead to better outcomes for the students? So it's, they're pretty tall order within one year. Um, oh, that's come up. It's very strange, but never mind. Um, <laughs> I have to take you through it. The two blocks are from year one and year two. The and you have it in your handout. The first two bars, so the two left-hand bars, 
uh, before and after intervention for the, for the uh, experimental schools, those who received the workshop. And this is just looking at teacher knowledge, saying, thank goodness, yes, teachers really did show an increase in their understanding of ADHD over the course of this year, compared to the control schools, who are the two light bars who didn't differ across the time. They had access to the materials. They could have seen the materials if they wanted to, but they didn't have the workshops. Oh, why is this such a funny color? This is terrible. Um, sorry about this. The, these are now looking at the teacher ratings of the students in the classes. And we obviously, we're looking primarily at the students who were rated as very inattentive or, or somewhat inattentive. Um, so there was being seen marked improvements in the teacher ratings of inattention and hyperactivity in the schools that received the workshop compared to those who did not receive the workshop. Um, it's quite dramatic. And of course, it could be just an altered perception. And if that's just what it is, it's great. If teachers are perceiving these youngsters to be less inattentive and hyperactive, then I know that things will be working much more positively in the classroom. But what was exciting is that it wasn't just perceptions. Um, under the, uh, there's an anthropologist we had because we're very sensitive about going into classrooms and observing. We certainly didn't really want researchers going into classrooms and observing teachers per se, and certainly not us. So we had an anthropologist who lived in the area and was very good at sort of getting a sense of classrooms, and she was completely unaware of what the study was. We said, we're just interested in how teachers work with students over the course of a year. She didn't know there was intervention going on or anything. So what she did, she observed teachers at the beginning of the year and at the end of the academic year, and I think she observed about 14 classes overall, where the teacher was the same at beginning and end. And she found, very excitingly, she came back to us and said, it's amazing. There are, you know, most teachers show some change, but there are some who show dramatic change. We said, oh, interesting. And her report said, well, what was really noticeable was the first time when she was in the classroom, basically she couldn't understand what the kids were to do because she couldn't understand the instructions. At the end of the year, she said she knew, A, what subject it was, what the topic was, and B, she could follow the instructions. Because she said, finally, the instructions were given clearly for her as an independent observer. The second comment was she said, it's quite striking. There are no more isolated children sitting all alone by themselves, which puzzled her in her first observation. Because of different seating preferences, many times a youngster with ADHD might have been pulled out away from the class uh, for the rest of the group and sat separately or sat right under by the teacher's desk or right at the back somewhere isolated. And she said that didn't happen anymore. There were many, all of them were in groups. And the third thing was the positive climate in the classroom. It turned out that 70% of those teachers in the experimental were the teachers who changed the most. And very few of the teachers in the control program changed that dramatically. So again, taking this information and using it in their own way, taking what they wanted to do, these teachers made dramatic differences in terms of the climate, the tenor of that classroom. And our preliminary data also said that these youngsters' reading didn't decline. The youngsters' reading skills in the control schools unfortunately declined over the year. And these youngsters, some of them increased, but they didn't decline, which is a positive thing. I'd like to have seen them grown. Um, the other final slide, which is almost, again, impossible to see, I'm afraid. Um, I have no idea why we've suddenly gone to weird colors. Um, was that... Uh, the youngsters, when we did direct observations, um, also showed um, really marked improvements in their on-task behavior. So they were no longer off-task as much. They were engaged, but not as actively as we'd like them. So they were no longer you know, under the desks, looking out at the back of the classroom. They were on task, but sometimes more likely to be sitting more passively watching. I think only two of the 100 kids we were watching were on medication, by the way. Um, these, you know, we were not doing with diagnosed children in general. There were many youngsters with diagnosis, but they just happened not to be being treated with medication that year. Um, but nonetheless, it looked much calmer at the end of the year than the beginning of the year, so it was exciting to see that. So we do believe um, that we can make a difference, but it 
I would believe it would take at least a year. I do not believe the types of changes that need to be occur in instruction, in approach, can be done by a one-day workshop, can be done rapidly. So my comment to you is don't feel discouraged if when on Monday it seems the same as it was on Friday um, because it does take time to change. Um, but all of these teachers were very skeptical initially. I remember the first one or two workshops, and they said, yeah, well, Rosemary, it's all very well, but, but we also were in the classrooms a lot. So one of the things that we suggest is that it, can be, it doesn't have to be us, but always having an extra pair of eyes in a classroom when you're trying to make changes is so helpful. And so that, I think, may be partly why I believe this particular intervention was quite effective, because there were, we were in the classrooms at times, not every day, of course, but we went and visited. The teachers could call us and ask questions, ask to help problem solve. So there were many resources the teachers could call upon, and they knew that other teachers in their school were also trying to effect change. And they also knew that every so often, every few, couple of months, they would get together with another group of teachers from other schools and exchange ideas. So I think a lot of it is promoting dialogue between teachers from different schools, different programs, can be, again, one of the magic ingredients in making it easier to sustain change and make change in your own classroom settings. So again, there were simple things, basically, in looking at instruction, how you give instructions, looking to reduce the cognitive load of any activity, looking at the curriculum and thinking, how complex is this? What does a youngster require, need to know in order to deal with this unit, this lesson in this unit? And often it came down to when the teachers were problem solving on this, they realized that often it was the terminology that many of these youngsters did not grasp or remember the terminology. So in subsequent lessons of the unit, the teacher would be referring to these items the kids didn't know. So that's when they began to build these word walls and so could constantly refer back to critical concepts. Some of the kids needed it right by their desk because if they were writing, they couldn't deal with the looking up and down because they lost their place or got distracted. So they place the critical definitions right inside their binders. So there were many simple things. Writing, for example, was one of the major challenges. I think 99% of teachers said that was the major challenge, no matter what age we were talking about, trying to get the youngsters to put something on paper. And one teacher came up with what I would believe was one of the most effective strategies where she really did a kind of barter system where she chose a story that seemed to be a very popular story for the kids. And it was that she'll read a little bit and ended right at a kind of cliffhanger. And the kid had to write. She provided them with structured sheet of paper just in boxes. And they only had to write or draw, depending on their age, one thing in a box at that gap. So she read a bit, and they said, OK, draw a picture, write it down, whatever one word for that what happened that I've just read to you. And as soon as we've done that, I'll read the next bit. So she chunked it, a minute reading, write, a minute reading, write, a minute reading, write. By the end of that lesson, she had more written than she'd ever had before from everybody in the class, including youngsters with a diagnosis of ADHD without medication. So I think it's a little strategies like this. Gradually she built it up so the boxes became bigger because the kids complained there wasn't enough space. So it was really interesting to see how she'd shaped it from very simple drawing a one word, nothing doesn't matter about the spelling, just getting the fluency of thinking and the speed of writing something on the page. And many teachers now, apparently in that board, are beginning to use simple techniques like that um, to really increase the writing. And once the kids had started and had confidence that they could write, and they, then they could generate this across so you didn't have to keep reading stories all the time. But that was the starting point because it was such a barrier. So this was the sharing that went on. And we found many of the teachers shared different strategies that we won't think of because we're not teaching in the classroom all the time that they came up with that other teachers hadn't. And it was that community, that professional learning community that allowed masses of progress. So I'm going to stop there. And just to remind you, 
that whereas whenever you remember and you have a child in your classroom that you think is challenging, stop and think a minute. Because if a kid is challenging in your class, in your school, but there are lots of classes and lots of schools and lots of kids who are challenging. So beyond thinking about the individual kid, you need to start thinking about what's happening at the bigger systems, the school system as a whole, the employers, the societal, because these kids have this habit of growing up. And I think when we start to think of the bigger picture, it means that at every, un- every week, every unit you're teaching, think ahead. To, if the kid doesn't grasp it, what does this mean for this kid? And we know, well, I showed you the outcome. It'll mean early school dropout. It'll mean not getting good jobs. It'll mean all of these things. So sometimes when you feel at the most frustrated, it's a good, I always say, just remember a triangle and think ahead. That what is not gained in this class definitely won't be gained in the next class. They'll be a little bit further behind. So it is a responsibility, but it's so, very small things can be effective with partnerships with the medical community. This is how I believe that we can move ahead. But it's partners. You can't do it alone. You need the support from other teachers, the support of your principals, support of your support teacher, your other resources. So again, it's a, it's a partnership that will make things work over time, not quickly. So I'm going to end as I started that in order to really promote success for these youngsters with inattention, with ADHD, working memory, in the educational sector, we now have to do what we're good at doing, and that is targeting the cognitive and academic aspects of ADHD, not just the behavior, because that actually will take it, usually it'll deal with itself by adulthood. Behaviors sort of subside a little bit, but the lost learning will remain lifelong unless we address it. I'm going to stop and let you go before you all melt, and thank you for your attention on a beautiful day outside and a very hot day inside. <laughs> Sure. So the question is, um, to what extent are any of these materials relevant for um, individuals within the correctional system, for example? Is that correct for um, both the staff and the individuals? And the particular materials that we've developed under this Teach ADHD were clearly designed for really grades, you know, sort of one to, one to six. Um, we're currently revamping because we're wanting, now moving with the secondary sector, the adolescents and young adults. And we're just beginning to work now with the college systems too. The basic information about ADHD, both the video and the um, materials about ADHD is applicable for any, anybody because it talks about the, what's the current situation of ADHD. So it was really the first part of the video that is, the, is relevant. But obviously the, the rest, the kind of examples about teaching are not because they're for elementary school children. Um, but there are many websites that I think are quite useful. Um, besides ours, there's also the Alberta Education System has done a beautiful website. It's on your handout, uh, I believe the first handout. So the Alberta, Ontario, Alberta Education System has done a nice piece of work for this. Um, there's the DVD available from CADAC um, that's available. CADAC? CADRA. <laughs> There's as many, there are many materials that are available. I still think, though, that when you're dealing with something like the correctional system, you're needing to have additional information that's a bit more pertinent because of where the people are at that point in life. So it needs, I think, a, a basic understanding of ADHD. That has to be in place. That it is possible to use any of the current materials for that. Um, but then I think that would be, to me, a, a necessary step to develop additional 
considerations, just like we have to do for the college students, for example. The, um, on the website, so Hospital for Sick Children, there is a parallel version for parents. So the Teach ADHD is actually written for educators, for teachers, but we've translated it and you often focused on slightly different things. So the Sick Kids website has a site called aboutkidshealth.ca. And that has information about many types of difficulties, of problems, of medical conditions, including ADHD. And so we've written a, much more specifically for parents on that website. 